he kept walking. Now, my brother, you know, when he asked me to be a part of his circle and the knowledge that he shares with, with these symbols, I, uh, I didn't have a problem saying yes because I knew what they meant. I knew where they came from. And I knew that he was doing a good thing with them. When I say that you already know, he would say that to you too. You already know. Because living your everyday life, you, you do come across a situation where you lose your balance, where you're in nature. Every, every day, these symbols are part of your life. And when he asked me to be part of it, he said, you carry a chanupa. I said, uh -huh. He said, and you know, all them symbols are built into that. That's why you carry them. He said, everything that I've learned, you were there when we were learning it. I said, yeah, we, you know. Uh, and so my message is really simple. Is just to be kind and loving every day. It's not hard. The hard What's hard about life is to be a criminal, a drug addict, an alcoholic. So where you're at, you already know. When I tell you, you know, all you have to do is start to remember. Creator talks to all of you. You just have to listen. Go out and sit by yourself out in the trees for two or three hours and listen. Because when you think you're thinking, you're not thinking, that's him talking to you. <laughs> that's how he talks to you. When you're, when you're loving what you're hearing, it's because you love him and you love what he's telling you, then you're loving yourself. It's all this stuff you already know. I told my brother, I said, brother, you know, I, I went to a couple conferences with him. I think one in Colorado. Uh, no, two in Colorado. Anyway, um, it, it, it was difficult for me to be, uh, because I'm a pipe carrier. I'm a uh, I have been since I was a young man. And for me, the the Chinupa stands alone. So all the all the teachings and learnings and understandings that I have about trying to live a good life came from the Chinupa and the way that we look at Mother Earth and, and understanding what love is. When, when the Creator, when He created the Earth, He created out of love. He, when He created the land and the and the water and the and the and all the all the life that you see in the water and the air, the trees. It's all life, and he, he did it because he loved it. So when he created you in his image, he gave you that love that he has. So when you go through life, when you, when you see the sky and, and you appreciate the air and the, and the water and the trees, then you love it because without it, we're not surviving. Look, if all the trees on earth were gone, 
the world would not live. If all the water was gone, the earth, we would all die. Now, if all the people were gone, what do you think would happen to the earth? The earth will live in peace. <laughs> Though it, it, it just it goes to show you how important the birds are and the trees are in the water. We not, are not more important than any of them. That's simple to understand. It's easy to understand that. So in, in our prayers, in a Chinupa way, we're always thankful for that every day. Every day we're thankful and grateful for breathing, for waking up. Because we can live, we can love every another day. It's simple. And to be kind, it, it, it's, not, it's not a difficult thing to do. All these symbols that that uh, that the books uh, were written about, they, all the interpretations came from this this land right here, this this home. My my nephew uh, and, and all the the spiritual peoples of. This land, all, all those all those messages came from our ancestors because that's where they're at. Now, we don't know, understand those symbols, but they're there. So we ask them and they tell us. But they say, but you already know that. All you have to do is live it. And that's where I, I used to tell my brother, I don't need to go to those because... I already know that. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that you don't know. I'm just saying you know. You know, the, the thing about my brother and uh, all the people that he's met, throughout the country, through all the different conferences, he's always had the mind that's been open to everybody and anybody, the heart that's open to everybody, because he accepted what people had to say in a loving way, and he didn't judge anybody. And he always, he always encouraged people to step up, to do more, and, and, and and that's probably why you're here. Because you are, you are living, you are doing what, what, what he brought to your attention through these symbols. I, I, I carry them, I carry them in, a, I have a little book. And, and I know a lot of you, you know, we, we pay our bills, you know, this is how much money I got. This is uh, what I got to pay and all that. You know, and that's right. You know, it's like, oh, we got to take care of this all the time. Well, I have a little book like that with bills and stuff in it. Then last year, I was like, well, that's not the most important. So I, I tore those pages out and I put all the symbols in there first. This is what's more important right now than I put all my bills way at the end of my book. They're still important, but they're not a priority. And, and I think uh, a lot of us here, you know, we're we're uh, we're older. You know, we're we're in the age where we we have grandchildren and great grandchildren, and the way we think it changes as we mature, um, and we're experiencing passings of our relatives more and more. It seems, you know. Uh, and with that, you know, with, with my brother's passings, uh, I was there for, for my brother Sherwin. My brother Lauren, I, I stayed home, even though it was like 30 miles away. I couldn't have seen him. But I sat and prayed instead because the way that he lived 
his life, I knew he's okay because the many times that we talked, we prepare ourselves our whole life for that day when we get to go home. That's how you live your life. This life, it's it's important. You know, your truths are important. You know, your bills can be important too if you want them to be important. But, but what's important to me, what was important to my brothers, to a lot of my relatives that carry chanupas, we prepare our minds and our hearts to meet creator. Because we're only here if we're lucky, you know, 60, 70, 80 years compared to, you know, time doesn't exist there, only exists here. So when, when I say you already know, you already know what I'm telling you. When your belief is so strong, you don't need to believe anymore. You just know. They say, how strong is your belief? Well, I already know, but I don't need to believe, I already know. Other people need to believe, so you help them to believe what you know. It's like, what's his name? The, the real smart guy with the hair all over, looks like Joe Plum, what's his name? Einstein? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, he cracked me up. The, uh, you know the, uh, I think Einstein he got he got asked one time by one of his professors about if he believed in God or Creator or whatever, and Einstein said, "Oh, I, do. I believe, I believe there's one." And the professor said, "Well, you, you can you prove it?" He goes, "Well." I can't prove that you have a brain, but I believe you do. <laughs> so your belief system is is not what you have to see. You know, you just you just know. You just know. And I think with uh with my brother, you know, my brothers, it not not just not just uh, uh, my brothers, Lauren and Sherwin, John, you know, I got relatives, I got grandsons, uh, great grandchildren that that carry these ways they, that I'm so proud of because they're 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 living it a lot earlier than I when I when I started because I grew up in a Catholic school. And so, and so uh, when the Freedom Religion Act, well, that's that's oh, you know, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna learn what my ancestors. I, I look up to them and I, because that's who I am. I'm a Hakdewa. I'm not an Indian. I'm not a Sioux. I'm a Hakdewa of this land. My family is a Hakdewa, and so. And that, when my 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 little granddaughter Hazel, she's a hunk, and her name is so pretty. When 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 uh, when you ask her what her Ihonkdawa name is, she's so proud to tell you. She tell you, and she's when she says it, she's real proud because she's proud of who she is. She's named after all her grandmas, and I'm proud she's here. She she wanted to come with us. So she said, Low with a mark. She's but but that's what uh these ways, these 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 beliefs, what what you know is to share as much of it as you can with all the people that you love. And that's what 
that's what the Chanupa is all about, is to share. Um, you know, I'm not going to give a history lesson on, on uh, you know, when the, when the, uh, the, the other lands come over here. Uh, it, it was just a big lack of understanding and communication because I think if people understood the kind of loving people that we are, then things would have been a lot different. It was, it's not until today's times and uh, understanding it's very important because understanding can bring you closer together or it could just tear you apart. When people get married, you know, you're, you're, you, you understand, okay, you want the same things in life. You want these children, you want this home. And so when it comes together and, and, and things are good, but so, somewhere along the way, someone might get a change of heart. So the understanding starts to change. Um, I see it all the time. People uh, together and minds and hearts change and they start to understand each other and they, they separate because there's an understanding. So understanding can do that too. So through the centuries of misunderstanding, I think today uh, I'm, I'm uh, grateful, thankful for all the people that my brother brought together under these conferences, the ceremonies, all, all the, uh, the races of people that, that he brought to our home, you know, from uh, Hawaii and uh, South America. Australia, there's people from all these different countries that come here to pray with us and to dance with us. And I'm grateful for that because it gives us the opportunity to show you how simple love is. It's easy to say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I could say that all day long. But the thing is, in, in our language, we never had a word for love. We, don't have, we didn't have one just until like 10 years ago. So how, how we understood when someone loved us, it was through the actions. It was through how we treated each other. It was always loving. No one had to say it because it was all loving. We all knew it. Like when I say you know, you know, that's how that's how strong a love can be. You don't even need to say it because you feel it. When someone just gives you a hug for no reason and, and or or goes out the way to make you a plate or bring you some water or whatever, you know, they do it because they love you in the simplest form, maybe, or smile at you. All these little things you already know. You know the the when I first uh, stood up here, I I felt my brother. Oh, I don't know if I can talk now, but he always. Uh, he always put me in a leadership position all the time whenever he had the chance. And he'd do it so quickly. I need you to do it. And, and I never say no to him for that. I couldn't say no because he was always so helpful to me. He helped me all the time. Sometimes we ask him to help and he's helping doing something. So uh, I know he loved me. He, and, and my father the same way. You know, uh, 
myself, uh, Sherwin, Lauren, John were coming from Pipestone one time and we brought that up to him. I said, Dad, you know, all these years, we've never heard you say, I love you. So I said, Dad, I love you. No response. And Sherwin, Dad, I really love you. John, Dad, I really love you. He had no response, no response. Lauren, the same thing. Then my dad just, out of his silence, he sees the first time, I love you all. That's all he said. Then he told us, we never, we never, uh, we never had to say that before. But he told us the one time in our life, but he said, I love you all. And that's all, that was enough. But we know it already. The way he raised us, the way he took care of us, all the things he taught us. It was all in loving way, loving manner. And I noticed uh, uh, when my brother, he asked me to uh, help him at the Sundance over in Iowa. <laughs> my little brother, he said, don't go over there. It's like, uh, what's that? Place? Woodstock. <laughs> it's raining muddy over there all the time. I was, I was laughing. I said, no, you know, I've been to Sundance where it's just muddy. But, but I went and uh, and it's the first time meeting uh, a lot of my my brother's uh, adopted relatives. You know, uh, they're they're. I, I knew that they loved him by the way they treated me. You know, their first meeting. You know, they're going out the way and like giving me hugs and uh, asking me if I want anything and trying to make me comfortable. And he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah." Wash day. You guys know. So uh I, I was I was happy to be a part of that. Um the, the only the only thing that that I pointed out to my brother was this lot of lot of protocols in the Sundance that that I pointed out that he said, oh, let it, it's learning. I said, yeah, but in, in the protocols, a lot of the protocols are for your, your safety. It's not, sometimes uh, it, it's like, it's like, my, like my granddaughter. Uh, yeah, it's okay to play outside. Yeah, you could go play, but don't run all over and jump in cars. With, and, you know, there's, there's protocols. If you're going to play, okay, well, play out here where I can see you. So, uh, so the protocols that are in place for a lot of our ceremonies, it's for health and safety of all of you, because we love you. We wanna, we wanna, we wanna watch you. Make sure that what you're doing it, we're, we're supporting what you're doing, and that you're doing it, and everything's gonna be good. And and uh, when we came back, well, I think the first year home it was it was kind of difficult for him because I told him I said there's gonna there's gonna be a, a, a lot of words said because I think uh the ceremony is is uh not what we're used to because there's a lot that 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 needs to be done to uh, protect the relatives and so he said, that's why I brought it home, because you, grandchildren, everyone can, can share and teach. Because we all are part of that same system, that same, that same belief, that same knowing. So... Everything that he shared with the, 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 the symbols and the knowledge and understandings 
in the books that even were, were printed. It's all to help you. I think, uh, you know, the there's a difference in uh, learning techniques amongst people. I think the Western Hemisphere and the Eastern Hemisphere of the world the same way. You got, you know, the Europe and uh, the the thought process is different. Um, I think that's what I'm thinking. I don't know, but that's what I'm thinking. Because your left and right brain are are they they function they, they have different functions. So in, in learning in our people, learning is not for us sitting in school getting lectured seven or eight hours a day. That's that's not how that's people can learn that way and. Uh, yeah, I've, I've learned that way. I've learned, I've, I've went through college and graduated. And so I, I've done that. But I noticed uh, uh, working with uh, the Indian children now is it, it, the learning comes through being active in what you're learning. So doing, if you want, our, our children, they want to do something. They want to use their hands they want to use their legs. Uh, they want to, the sitting is not uh, the best way for uh, our native children sometimes to, to learn. But it works, you know, it works. The, I know what's funny, uh, I, uh, I, I got a degree in business and uh, I, I liked the algebra. I was good in algebra and geometry and, uh, you know, a lot of it. So I went to college and I got a degree, but, you know, I don't even use some of that knowledge. I don't. It's funny. <laughs> and, and then, uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm wearing my beret today because I'm a veteran too. I uh, anyway, I I went in the military, and uh, and I was, I went in as a, a pipe carrier. I not carry a pipe. Well, I only went in because they allowed me to take my pipe with me. And that's my that was my protection, and so. Uh, so the learning that I got from the military is, you know, they, 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 they strip you, they take all your clothes, they shave your hair, and, 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 they, and they give you uh, protocols that you, that they have a different language, you know. The, the wall is not a wall, it's called the bulkhead. <laughs> they have a whole different language. Uh, and so... Uh, so knowing what I know when I went in, it, it became, uh, I, I was helping young men in there uh, that were uh, probably the first time away from home, 18, 19, 20-year-old kids that were crying at night. And, and I'd go to them and, and, and I'd help them because I remembered the first time that I was away from my mother and father, I was four years old and I got put in a boarding school. And I was there till I graduated. So I knew what, what being homesick, being without your parent. So I shared what I knew with them and I helped them to, to, uh, to know, to understand that feeling that it's okay. So, but through the military, there's there, there's different stages that you go through. And for me, because what I know, the philosophy did not, it, it didn't, I tolerated it, let's put it that way. I I, I said, okay, why? Well, I, I signed up for uh, four years, so I'm going to honor my my word, my signature, and, you know, and I'll do it. So I did it. 
Uh, same, uh, I come back. I went back to school and uh, I got my degree uh, working in casinos. I managed a couple casinos. Okay, now the degree helped me to be a manager in I managed Fort Randall. I managed a, a casino up north in Watertown. Um, but the thing with that too was whenever there's money, people change their thought process change because when you see money all over, it changes the way you think. You, you, you start to think it, how can I get my hands on some of that money? And when there's so much money floating around all over, then people try to figure out ways to, to get it the easiest way they can. And that's through stealing, um, cheating. And so that philosophy, uh, the mentality didn't jive with what I know. It didn't, it, it, that's not how I want to be. I don't want to be a part of that system. I was a key licensed employee where my, my status in the casino, I could make decisions that the, the elected officials couldn't, so they would ask me to do things that were not even um, right. <laughs> so that system, I, I didn't want to be a part of that system. Then I came, uh, I came home and I start working with children. And uh, I, uh, I started uh, doing child protection work. And I did that for uh, probably 15 years. And I think the more I knew about that, it, again, it, it, be, it, it be question if I should really be part of that system because what I saw and what I start bringing up was there was a money, there was a money, there's a money issue there where Indian children are getting taken and, and when, it, when a child get taken, well, the state office, they'll get on average about $4,500 a month and they would give a foster parent you know, three hundred dollars or whatever. So, when I, when I got into uh, the ICWA at the at the federal level, I noticed that, but in, in this state anyway, about eighty percent of the children were Native American, and they were kept in the system till they were eighteen. So the state was you know, getting four grand for each kid or whatever. And it, it's almost like, uh, uh, well, you you know, the stuff all over the news now. But it, 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 was, it was done for profit. And so I became, I started an equal consortium with uh, all the tribes in South Dakota. And a lot of this stuff was uh, being brought to light. Uh, there was, uh, I think, two judges in Rapid City that lost their jobs because they were doing that purposely. So again, I, I changed, uh, uh, but at least I brought some things to light for our people. The other thing is, you know, there, there, there's a lot of uh, abuse and neglect, not only in Indian country, but around the whole country. Um, and through these types of meetings, uh, uh, you know, children are a, a big part of 
who we are because we were children one time. Some of us are still think like children, act like children. <laughs> we have children, we have great grandchildren. So being a part of that system to me uh, is what matters the most. So now I, I work at a school with, you know, the Indian children from all over the country. They come to the school and we do our best, you know, to, to teach them what, what we know, hoping that it'll change the way they think, the way they behave, the way they live. And so when you live your, your life from day to day, being thankful and grateful, it's good to make, uh, make people happy, children. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of little things that we can do all through our days that, man, you just make you feel good. Smiling, people react to that when uh, when you say "I love you." People react to that. There's all these little things you can do, and and a lot of you do that. Many of you do that. A lot of people that are here do that every day. And and the thing about what you know is once, once you know, then sometimes, this is just me thinking, sometimes you don't have to attend these Star Knowledge conferences, you know what? You can go and you could start a circle of your own. Every one of you could start a circle of your own all over and everything gets bigger. When you talk about helping the world and the community, whatever you know, you can create, you're all creators. I'm sure my brother told all of you that, that you're creators. You can create unity, you can create love, you can create trust, you can, you can create whatever you want. You just have to do it. Believe it and know it. That's all you have, that's all you need to know. You have all the tools already. Some of you have been raised by grandmas and grandpas, you know. They taught you a lot of good things. All you have to do is get out and share. It's that simple. I always, uh, I always uh, heard this story. Well, not really a story. It's a, it's a little... Uh, uh, Story, well, yeah, story. <laughs> this one chief, he come out of a, he come out of his teepee years ago. He come out of his teepee and he, he, he didn't have a smile on his face, and all he said was, "It's hard. It's hard to be the Hongdua. It's hard to be native." And there was people around that heard him and saw him. So they believed it, but it wasn't, it wasn't that way. It was just for that moment that he said that. It wasn't for all, you know. It was just in that moment he was having a difficult time. So people took it that it's hard to be, it's hard to be a pipe carrier. I tell you, it's tougher to be a drug addict or an alcoholic. That's tough. When you carry a good heart, that's that's all you need. With uh, with my brother's teachings, you know, he uh, I, I I I listen to start listening to on YouTube. I want to see what he's got to say. 
And I'd li- I, I listen to it like halfway. Oh, I really love that. <laughs> and I'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that and, and but it's good to see him you know it's good to see him i love i love doing that and then uh yeah but i was, I was like yeah really no. but yeah but still his messages are out there well they're not his they're ours they you know the when we talk about star knowledge it's it's the knowledge that we all carry because we're part of the universe all the knowledge you have is star knowledge. <laughs> Just because on earth doesn't mean you're not part of it. You're you're the universe. I I uh, I, I, I want to mention. Uh, I did a my my latest painting over there uh, by that pillar, um, uh, in the 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 gold uh, white buffalo calf woman. On white buffalo, I, I painted, uh, I finished, I think, last week or a week ago, week and a half, maybe. Anyway, um, with with that with that painting, it, it, to me, it, it was simple. It's simple. It's, uh, it's Unchimaka and the source of our food, clothing, shelter. Buffalo, and the simplicity of that—it's pretty. The background and the the mountains and the grass, but in the reflection of the water, is is the universe of all the knowledge that came through that chanupa. It. It, it's part of the universe, all them symbols and everything that came that we talk about and share over the years, that is where they came from is out there. In the water, when they say the water is life, that's where the life came from, was that water. The reflection of the water and all the medicine that goes along with it. The chanupa and the teachings and the prayers and the songs and everything is all part of that. And you already know that. So you're listening to a bunch of stuff you already know. <laughs> So with that, uh, there's uh, you know there's there's a lot of vendors here. You know Eddie and uh, Miss Rivera from Ohio. She stopped in Anthony. Uh, stop and and support the artists. The the I think they you know what yeah. Support support each other, you know, love each other, you know, because uh, I, I, I always tell people, you know, the my uh, my art, um, there's a there's a story in each one. And then, of course, there's a story in every song, you know, there's a story in everything. And uh, uh, all it takes is just to stop and say, well, what is this? And then you'll get a whole understanding of of what a piece of art is. So where some, you know, I was telling people, you know, you buy a piece of art, you know, it lasts longer than a house and a car. You take care of it because all it does is just sit there. It just sits there. You know, you got what, like the Mona Lisa and all these pieces of art that are billions and billions of dollars or millions or whatever, you know, the, and they've been around forever. You know, they've been wrong for hundreds of years. Songs the same way. Dances the same way. Prayers the same way. So support what the vendors are, are here to share with you. I think there's they all have stories and um, 
the, like the skulls over there. I don't know nothing about no skulls. Lauren, you know, he'd probably tell me if I asked him, you know, and I'm sure I would get a good story from about a skull. So, yeah. So, yes, uh, stop, visit, listen, ask questions, you know, have a good time and love each other. That's all. Thank you. Midaki oh. wase. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Star Knowledge Conference here in Pigston, South Dakota. Um, under the guidance of Chief Golden Light Eagle, his daughter, Nikki Zephyr, is uh, continuing to promote and continue his legacy here. So we want to just make a, a strong welcome to everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy lives to come and remember family, to reunite with people that you don't remember until you get up close. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Glendra Poe is not here at the moment, I believe. Our next speaker is Thomas Johnson. Thomas, are you gonna be ready? Or I'm a little early. Okay, so Thomas Johnson, he has been featured on the History Channel Ancient Aliens segments, and he is from Serpent Mound currently, adjoining uh, the meteor crater that's out there. Tom is a rock man from Michigan. He's been collecting rocks since he was four years old. Moving to Southern Ohio, met his beautiful wife over here, Terry Rivera, and uh, he collects trilobites from the old seabed of 438 million years old there in that Ohio Valley, Peebles, Ohio. Um, so please, he's got some really great information to share with us. Welcome, Thomas Johnson. Nikki said hi to everybody at the door. <laughs> She's back there. Wave at her, okay? <laughs> she gets a little bit shy. We'll get to see her a little bit here and there, okay? That worked. Good. Good. Hi, camera. Oh, oh there it goes. Oh, let me. Lots of tricks. Well, first off, I'd like to thank everyone for having me here. Nikki, Zephyr. Thank you for inviting Terry and I. It's been uh, been about 12 years since I've been out in this part of South Dakota. And uh, I was in, actually Terry was the one that after I first met her, she wanted me to come out and help um, uh, Sundance Chief, who was Choctaw that was living out here. Um, 
to help build a house for. And um, we had a fundraiser and we raised uh, about $9,000. And um, we went on to Facebook and we said, hey, anybody interested in learning how to build a house? And there's people came from all over the United States. There ended up being 12 of us, mostly kids that never had a hammer in their hand. And we all met up in uh, Wagner. And uh, in five days, we built a house for this gentleman. I believe it's on YouTube, but um, it was pretty comical, actually. And the, the guy that we're building it for was actually a... Uh, retired engineer and he had built houses on reservations all of his life and he retired and he watched his struggle through this whole process of building a house from scrap and um, when we got all done I noticed he had a shed there and he opened the door and it was full of tools I said so how come you have all these tools he goes oh I got them at a yard sale and then he told me the story. But he wanted to watch us build this house just to see if we could do it. So the joke was on us. It was fun. Anyway, we did that. But that has nothing to do with why I'm here today. Actually, Chief Golden Light Eagle was um, an integral part of my second part of my life. And I had met him in uh, 2010 at a Star Knowledge Conference in Circle Mound, Ohio. And uh, I came to the conference, and I believe Silver Star was there, along with a lot of other grandmothers. And uh, Terry had invited me. She said, why don't you come on out and speak? And at that time, I said, yeah, why not? Because I've, I've done a lot of speaking engagements on on my background of geology and paleontology. And uh, we're living on the edge of an asteroid crater there at Circle Mound. So I said, sure, I'll come out and speak. I had no idea where this would, where it would lead me by meeting Chief Golden Light Eagle and all of the other people associated with him. And my first thought was when I walked into a room and I listened to the grandmothers arguing amongst themselves. I said, do I really want to be a part of this? And I thought, well, they're just talking. And later I, I learned that's the way they get things done. They just, their discussion is a little different than my discussion or what I'm used to. So you have to learn the ways. And um, it, it took me many years to learn the protocol that the uh, that the natives used, but I learned so much from it. And to begin with, um, I was brought up as a Methodist, and um, my preacher, my minister, um, he was into archaeology. So at the age of four years old. I used to go around the beaches of Lake Erie. My mom was Canadian. And uh, we had a cottage in Canada. I lived in Detroit. And I would go down to the beach. And my dad would go out in the boat and go bass fishing. But he said, you have to sit on the beach and play with the rocks or do whatever. Have fun. I'll be back in a few hours. And on the beach, I had found this little fossil with a star in it. And I thought, oh listening to the minister at church. He had a lot, of, lot to say about Native Americans and their ways, their pottery, things that they use for making pottery, and also taught me a lot about anthropology. And uh, with this little tiny implement that I found, if you will, it was a little pod called a blastoid. It took me till third grade to figure that out. But my third grade earth science teacher said, oh, you have a blastoid, look at this. He was a paleontologist. So he got me pushed into this path of paleontology and studying ancient marine life. 
But before all that happened, I'm walking down the beach on Lake Erie, and there's this round rock sticking out of the black sand. And I had my brother with me. He's five. And I said, Chuck, look at that rock. And he went over and he said, that's kind of out of place. And I said, well, yes, it is. Look, it has sutures in the top of it. And he said, what's that? And he kicked it. I said, it's a human skull. And it was a human skull. And I picked it up, looked at it, had one eye orbit and part of the top jaw. And we run home, run up the steps on top of this big moraine that we're living on top, looking over Lake Erie. <laughs> and I showed that to mom and her eyes got about this big. Where'd you find that? Down on the beach, mom. So we went down the beach and there was this big hillside we call Bird Mountain. We call it Bird Mountain because all the little swallows used to drill their holes in the side of the sand. And up the side of this cliff with all the sand was femurs and tibias and vertebrae and skulls. And over the course of five years, we picked up 18 complete skeletons off that hillside. And lo and behold, this uh, place where we had, it was a cottage. It was a row of cottages. All the neighbors were watching us over the years, dragging these bones back, sorting them out in the backyard, preserving them, because my minister never opened a Bible in Sunday school. He taught us about human anatomy and archaeology. So we glued all these bones back together, numbered them, put them in boxes, and lo and behold, 1960, here come the Ohio Provincial Police, the OPP. And they said, we understand you have some bones. And mom said, yes, we do. <laughs> and they loaded all the boxes in their squad cars and they left. 45 days later, they came back and they unloaded all the boxes. And they said, here's your certificate from the University of Windsor. They're carbon dated at 1100 years old. They're glacial came. They're prehistoric and they're yours. There's no law protecting them. Because they thought maybe, they thought maybe it was a mass burial site from a murder, you know. Little did I know. But anyway, so I took those bones back and eventually we took them over the Ambassador Bridge legally. And at that time, like I say, there was no protection on human bones because it's 1960. And um I kept all those bones for all those years. And it's funny because in 1990, I had already moved to Ohio from Michigan. And I had my own little place down a little creek, not far from Serpent Mound. And the Repatriation Act came about, 1990. And all the bones were supposed to be put back in the ground from all the museums, the Smithsonian, all these different state organizations that had skeletons on exhibit, had to put everything back in the ground. And so we dug a big pit and we had a little ceremony and we put everything back in the ground. Well, that was the day my nightmare stopped because all those years, right up until 1990, I had reoccurring nightmares of hands coming out of the ground trying to grab me. And I never knew what it meant. And I didn't know what it meant until I met Chief oh, Golden buddy. Eagle. And I met him in 2010. That's 20 years later. And he said, those bones had spirits. And you put them in the ground. You did the right thing because now they're happy. So that was a circle. And, and what I'm trying to tell you today, this is all about circles for me. Um, it, it's just the way I've lived. I've never known why I do things. I've just happened to follow my intuition, my instincts. And you never know where that's going to lead you. So I, one thing I learned at an early age was patience. And going back to my early childhood, when I was four years old, my mom sat me in the corner of the living room with my other two brothers. They were older. And there was Uncle Edward. My mom had six sisters. And Uncle Edward was a medium. And at that time, 
it wasn't a good thing to be a medium because people were not into that type of thing. It was like taboo. And so Uncle Edward sat us down on the floor and he proceeded to tell my mom that I was going to work with the earth. And he gave my mom a diamond ring to give to me at the right time. And he gave my second brother a golden watch, a, a dress watch. And he said, Chuck is going to be a businessman. And the third brother, Harry, he got a gold pocket watch because he said, Harry is going to work for you. Well, 25 years later, mom sat us down and she told us a story. And she said, Tom, here's your ring. You're already in the rock business. You love rocks. Chuck is already an engineer. He's still an engineer. He's going around designing uh, computer programs for different corporations. He's 73 years old, but he's still working, flying around the world, working with computers. And my oldest brother retired from the railroad after 20 years. So there you go. My course had already been set, but yet I didn't know it until I was in my mid twenties. And it's funny because my parents never dissuade me from doing what I wanted to do. They never stepped in my path. Uh, they enabled me. And when I was 10, 12, 13 years old, before I could drive, my mom would pack me up in a car, drive me 70 miles south of Toledo and leave me at a rock quarry for a week or two with my backpack and my sterno stove in my pup tent in a quarry, people blasting and workers everywhere, trucks going back and forth. That was an adventure. And, and she would come back and pick me up and I'd help have all these great fossils. Today, they call that child abandoned. So you can see how times have changed. All right. Anyway, let me take a little drink here. And don't mind me, I've got a quite a bit of vertigo, thanks to COVID. I've been carrying it around for about a year and a half now. So I call it being drunk for free. But really, it's, it's just a, it's just part of the, whatever went around. I survived, a lot of people did. I know Chief didn't, but um, <clears throat> Chief reminded me of, of um, of some interesting people that I had met uh, over the years having a rock shop. I, uh, I started a rock, rock business in 1978. And um, in 1978, I, I was working for uh, General Motors and building Cadillacs. And thank you. And, and one day I decided that I was not gonna work for General Motors. And I went to a rock show in Tucson, Arizona. And I took all these fossils that I had collected all my life at this quarry in Sylvania, Ohio, in Tucson. And I made more in five days than I did in a week or in a year at General Motors. I came home with $30,000 in my pocket. And I said, you know what, here's your tool belt. You could build all the Cadillacs all by yourself. You don't need me. So that's really what kind of started me on this path of of the uh, of the rocks and, and actually making a living off of sustaining. And uh, I, I lived on the edge for many, many years in that business, kind of like a starving artist. Um, I think Mr. Guy Zephyr could attribute his life to that. He, he wondered if he could ever make a living doing paintings. And um, I think if you're persistent enough um, as something, and you concentrate and, and put your, your all into it, uh, you can succeed. It's just, you have to have that patience. And I, I think that's what a lot of the kids today are lacking is the patience because they want everything instantaneously. They look at that internet, they go, oh, this is, I want an answer right now, right now, right now. And I learned that I never went to school for any of the studies that, that I'm involved in. It was all hands-on experience. 
And I wasn't recognized with my hands-on experience until 1984 when I was approached by the National Museum in Washington to buy some fossils for an exhibit. And everybody at the conference at this show were selling them all these beautiful fossils and they were paying big dollars. And I was really tempted to take them up on the offer. But I said, why don't you just come out to my place in Ohio and I'll show you my collection and you can borrow whatever you want. And the guy says, the curator, he said, well, it, it's for 25 years. That's a long time to borrow something. I said, that's okay. I figured they'd come out and borrow a few specimens. So I laid out 1,500 specimens in this conference hall on tables. And him and his wife came out and looked around back and forth. And they went to lunch and came back. And I said, so which ones are you interested in? He says, we want the whole collection. I said, well, that's a lot. So I gave them the collection and they put it on exhibit for 25 years. 200 million people got to see it with my name on it. And that is the first break that I really got in the business, having the recognition by the very best people in the world saying, okay, we'll take you on. And, and here's what we'll do in return. Uh, we'll give you the galleries back when, they, when we're done with the exhibits and we'll write you grants for whatever you want to do. So here I am, this little kid, my mid twenties, and um, they went ahead and wrote grants for different research that I wanted to do with the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was all about the state fossil in Ohio, which is the trilobite. For those of you know, that don't know what trilobites are, yes, this thing. Uh, they're the first marine arthropods to have eyes. So they're the first eyes on Earth. And there's over 20,000 species of them. And when I started this little venture back in the 50s, late 50s, there was only 7,500 species. So I'm in a, in a, you'll never catch it. In other words, no matter how long I study this, I'll never catch up because more and more and more species are being found every day. But anyway, so I got all these fossils back in, let's see, 2011, they finally came back to me. And I built a gallery back in Ohio at our rock shop. And people come from all over the world just to see the trilobites. That's kind of cool. But the whole just, the whole gist of it, by giving something, by loaning something free, um, kind of made the expression, um, I'm here to give you something to look at and learn from and inspire. And that's what my whole life has been. Um, I've been collecting these beautiful fossils and giving them and selling them to different museums. But it wasn't for profit. It was to inspire other people to go ahead and search out and find something for yourself. So that was, um, it, it keeps coming back to me, having this little rock shop I have people that stop in and they say, you know, and we're from different universities, different doctors and whatnot. And they say, you know, um, I saw your exhibit back in 1985 and it inspired me to start my own collection, learning how things grew and, and learning the life habits. And I attribute that to you. And I'm going like, wow, there's something really cool. The other part of having a shop is, um, having it for so long now, it's where I think we're going on 27 years with just the shop. Um, when I first started, little kids would come in and I'd give a little kid a rock, say, here, there's your collection, start a collection. And then 25 years later, they come back with their kids and they have a degree in geology. I go like, wow, there's your reward. So you never know when you, what you say to people, how it's gonna affect people. Um, Another thing that happened as going a circle, um, in 1995, um, I went to Egypt on a world peace mission. And they said, you know where Serpent Mound is? And I said, well, sure. I live 15 miles away. At that time, I was living a little bit further away than I, than I am now. And uh, they said, well, we need pictures of Serpent Mound. So I get in the car, middle of the winter, 
drove up past this old Victorian house that they've been working on and restoring for three years. And um, it was for sale. Never owned a house in my life. And I sat in a parking lot across the street, and wrote down the number, called up my mom. I said, Mom, this old Victorian is for sale across the street. You think I can buy it? She goes, get it, get it. I go, okay. I went to the bank. They said, no, we can't give you a loan. You're in business for yourself. You know, you don't have no security. You know, you have no, no we can't do that. So I got my mom, mom to co-sign for it. And sure enough, she did. And I'll be darned, this first day we pulled up in the driveway to unload everything. Here comes the ex-landlord. And he was an undertaker. And he said, uh, have you seen any spoofs yet? I said, what's, what's a spoof? Uh, he said, oh, you'll find out. Well, we found out. The house is haunted. <laughs> but it's funny because the house isn't haunted because the house is haunted. It's haunted because of the ground that we're sitting on. Which leads me to this asteroid crater. We're sitting on the very edge of a five-mile-wide asteroid crater made 300 million years previous, before the Appalachian Mountains were even there. And at that time, it was a seabed. And when this asteroid struck, it drove a hole through the sea bottom 6,000 feet deep. Solid rock. And I, I brought up some samples. Uh, we can pass them out, or we can just take them over there and grab them at the table if you want. But it's called breccia. And within that breccia, there is cobalt, chromium, nickel, iridium, iron, and zinc. Now, when this asteroid hit, it created an anomaly by taking out the sea bottom 6,000 feet deep and changing all the magnetics. So you can imagine the magnetics in a five mile wide area have been disrupted. So understanding the magnetics of the earth and geology, every layer of the earth has a magnetic polarity. In other words, it has its own signature because the plates of the continents are constantly moving. So when this fossil or this organism was laid down in the ocean, when it died, it's facing one direction, there's a signature in the rock, there's your north. But when you take and move those polarities, when you break them, you create an anomaly. So five miles wide, we have what they call a vortex. And the whole ground is full of magnetic anomalies there. So it's not only us that is haunted, it's Serpent Mound, because it's three miles, it's inside of the asteroid crater. And the way we know this is by what happens at Serpent Mound. And some of the strangest things happen there is that when people go there and give an intention, it's, 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 it's immediate. Um, some of the different services or ceremonies that we've done there over the years, um, people would form a circle, 200 people. And we're all praying. And somebody would say, look up. It looks up, there's a perfect serpent mound in the sky, but there's no clouds. And you go like, ooh, that's cool. Humbotsman, if any of you knew who Humbotsman was, he came there and did a flag ceremony, or not a flag ceremony, a skull ceremony. We're all at the head of the serpent. And there are 13 skulls laid out there. Somebody said, look up. Look up. There's a perfect skull in the sky, but no clouds. And then Humbot's men came back later and did another ceremony. And we were at the spring. Uh, there's a spring right below Serpent Mount, which leads me to that big green or blue jug over there. There's five gallons of Serpent Mount spring water. So hopefully every one of you will get a drink of that because that's live water. That's what we drink. And we're down there at the spring with a, a gentleman from Hawaii. His name is Reynolds. He came to one of our conferences. He was a kahuna. And he blessed the spring. And we're all standing around it doing this little ceremony. This big rainbow shot across the sky. But there's no clouds in the sky. And where was the rainbow? Right over top of where Humbats was doing a ceremony with a thousand people. And it's like, oh, that was really powerful. Well, a couple of years after that, 
Reynolds calls up Terry and says, Terry, go out to Serpent Mound. And they're going to call in some ships. Well, Reynolds could see ships, kind of like Chief Goldenlight could. He he was something. He he could see ships when they when you can't see them, he could see them. He said, They're there, they're right there. And so Reynolds said, go out to Serpent Mound and sit there in the evening. We went out there. It was kind of like drizzling. Um, I took Terry's daughter out there, Aurelia, and a gentleman from West Virginia uh, who worked on the Chandra telescope. He was an astronomer and an engineer and his wife, Little One Star. And we sat out there by the spring and it got dark. And we're sitting there. And I said, Aurelia, sit on the edge of the spring. There's a big cement crop there. Sit on the edge of the spring, we'll take a picture. And my camera flashed. There's nothing in the background. There's no houses, just a big ridge. We got back, well, after we sat there for about an hour, I got to finish the story, but the cloud cover was real low and seven lights came in below the clouds and circled and left. And I said, thank you, Reynolds. You just validated your ideas that there was going to be ships because he said he could call them in. Went back and put that drive on the computer and right in back of Aurelia, against the backdrop, was a perfect triangle of seven ships. I said, okay. So those are the kind of things that I've been involved in and that have made me a believer. I guess it's through validation. And it's just, there's just so many stories. Um, we did a, 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 a spring equinox sunrise ceremony at Serpent Mount. And uh, there was probably about 20 of us there to watch the sunrise. It was cold. And Chief was there, of course, leading the ceremony. And we did some prayers. It was really cold that morning. And uh, I said, you know, I'm going to go back to the car. And he says, well, I'm going this way. You go this way. And it was equal distances. And I practically run back to the car. When I got back there, Chief was sitting in the car with the window rolled down, the motor running at a cigarette half smoked. I said, what is that all about? Well, he knew something about time and shape-shifting, if you will. And it's, it, it, it made me think. I said, what is time? How is he back there in the car, sitting there with a car warmed up with the cigarette half smoked? And he wasn't out of breath. It's like he'd been sitting there for half an hour, but he was he was just there with me five minutes previous, if that. So it, that's the kind of things that um, that he taught me, and it just it it just takes me back. And the other part that he taught me was about how the Earth is alive, and being into paleontology and geology, I looked at everything as an Earth. Okay. And sure enough, um, in 1976, I was on a dig in Clarksville, Ohio, with a bunch of paleontologists, and we were documenting a site. It's called Systematic Paleontology. And you'd write down the numbers of everything as you would find it. You'd write down a position, a depth in the formation, a direction, genus and species. So here I am. It's lunchtime. And I'm sitting here writing in my book, Isotelus, eight and a half inches long, five and a quarter inches wide, 16 inches off the base facing north. And I don't know why I wrote that down. And I went to lunch. An hour later, I came back. We pulled the big slab out, put it up on its side, about a 400 pound rock. And I took my hammer and my chisel went tink. And there was a trilobite that I had described an hour earlier the biggest trilobite of the day. And it was like, hmm, these things are talking to me. But I didn't know why until I met Chief. And Chief said, don't you know everything's alive? The earth is alive. It's all connected. So I think if you work with something long enough, you actually get a chance to experience that. And the other story that's connected with that is my friend, uh, childhood friend, Leon, 
Tyson, who now lives in Ecorian, Oklahoma, as a hermit digging trilobites. Um, we were in the Marble Mountains of the Mojave Desert. And um, this is 1980, probably 83. And uh, we're digging Cambrian trilobites that are the oldest ones. They're like 550 million years old. And uh, we're sitting there eating breakfast before we go up to dig. And he said, Tom, so I had this dream last night. And he said, I found this trilobite. It was the biggest trilobite I've ever seen. It was like eight inches long. And it had part of the head sheared off on the left side. And it was a whole analysis. He described the species. And I said, well, that's a cool dream. We went up the mountain. We started digging. About lunchtime, he started hooping and hollering. He says, Tom, come here, look at this. There was the trilobite that he found in his dream. To the T, it was perfect. I said, all right, there's your validation. Now I know there's something to this. So since that time, that's happened several times to me, especially with the big trilobites. For whatever reason, I've driven to a place. Um, Terry's daughter witnessed that. Um, if you mind anything, right? But sure enough, that trilobite must have been talking to me because I turned around, made a U-turn and went back and went to the exact spot where that trilobite was and said, there it is. So those are the kind of things that make you go, hmm, there's more to this than meets the eye. And so that's, that's the way this whole thing has been. Um, when Chief married us in 11-11-11, at 1111 in Cahokia, Chief and Blue Star and uh, Walking Bear and Gray Eagle were all there. We were on stage. We got married with a pipe. And um, of course, you know, when you get married with a pipe, that's forever. It's not like the marriage certificate. And um, when, I, uh, when I got married, uh, Chief handed me a microphone and he said, uh, is there anything you want to say to Terry? And I said, I've traveled across the universe to find you. Still gets me, right? And I don't know why he said that. It's just strange. It just popped in. Well, it wasn't a week ago. A man walked in the shop. His name was Rune Darling. He's a Viking. His whole lineage goes back to being a Viking. And he looked at my eyes and he said, I'd never seen this guy before. He said, you're a star man, aren't you? I said, am I? He says, yeah, I used to be a captain of a starship. I said, oh, really? I said, I wonder if that's why I told Terry I traveled across the universe to find her. So there was another circle. It's just things like that just really take you back. But um, this thing with Fumi. Okay, Fumi Johns, are you here? There you are, Fumi Johns. You came to us a few years ago. What's well, been about four years ago? And we started doing flag ceremonies. And what were the flag ceremonies about? May peace prevail on earth. And here I am in this place in Ohio. I came there because of world peace mission in 1996, going to Egypt and learning about that mission. And then just... Five years ago, we get a hold of Fumi, and she says, let's do a flag ceremony at Serpent Mound. There's another circle. It's another circle completed. And here we are today doing another one. But that's the way this, this whole thing has worked out for me. And I just want to share that with you, that you got to pay attention to these little messages that you get and follow your heart, follow your instincts, your gut, if you will. And it'll lead you places, but you have to really be patient to wait for those few little instances that point you in that direction. And the rest of it is history, I think. I never, who knows what the next circle is going to be, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And that's all I have to say about that. But if you have questions, I'll be glad to answer. Okay. The Serpent Mound was, well, there's some... <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of people wondering about that. Um, science says that it was built in 350 BC by the uh, Adena, which were the mound builders. And um, they came across the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Serpent Mound is influenced by the Olmecs, 
Okay, the Olmecs started about 10,000 years ago with the sun worship idea. Okay, you're going to worship the sun. It gives you something. You can see it. You can feel it. It gives you food. And they were farmers. Okay, Serpent Mound is a calendar for farming. It's for solstice and equinox, sunrise, sunset. And it faces towards the day of rebirth, June 21st. And so a lot of people come to Serpent Mound to get a new start. And I see that a lot in the shop. I say, well, why are you here? Well, I don't know why I'm here. I just got a divorce or somebody died. You know, it goes on and on. And they're, they're looking for a new start. So I believe that's what Serpent Mound is. But I believe the builders were from South America. And they came across the Gulf of Mexico, infiltrated North America via the river systems and built over 100 Serpent Mounds in North America. So if that answers your question. But there is, there's other speculation like uh, Graham Hancock, an uh, Apoc ancient apocalypse on the Netflix series. He came to Serpent Mountain. And he said, oh, it may have been built 18,000 years ago. But it, and it's plausible because the glacial ice sheet was still in place over North America, but Serpent Mound and everything east of there in the Appalachians was green. And there were civilizations living there at that time. So it is plausible that they were there. Now, were they actually farmers? No, I think they were hunter-gatherers, so they really had no purpose for building a calendar, if you will, for planting and harvesting. So that's that's the other part of it. But the people that you know, are in charge of Serpent now actually kicked them off of the site and banned them because of the way he thought, which is sad because they don't have an open mind and they're not open to other people's opinions which are, are really valuable. That's how people progress, move on. What else? Yes. Um, can you talk about the physical flow? Salt and water? Yes, yes. Do I want to talk about them? Yeah. All, all I know is that working with the rocks, okay, um, Every, every color has its own frequency. And what I've learned about crystals and rocks since I've been working with them is that give a blind man a rock and he can tell you what color it is. How does he do that? Through frequency. And hence the, the whole circle of how they affect the chakras of your body. Each, each chakra has a different frequency. So in crystal skulls, uh, the way I was explained to it, there was different crystal skulls made for different parts of your body. There's apparently 13 levels of the conscious mind, and each skull has a different has a different effect on that part of the conscious mind. Other than that, I just know they're cool. Yes. Well, yeah. The first time I met Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull was in 1962. Yeah, it was in Detroit, I was 10 years old. And it was at the Lancaster Armory, is at a rock show. Come on, mom, we're going to the rock show. And uh, so we went there and, and mom gave a dollar for the lecture of Anna Hedges, the girl that found it, Mitchell Hedges' daughter. And uh, at that time, that skull was in a glass cube. And you couldn't touch it, you couldn't photograph it, you could just look at it. I thought, well, this is really cool because it was a work of art. I was already in the lapidary, knew how to cut polished stones. And um, I left it at that, listened to her lecture, it was pretty cool. And then, um, well, it was about four years ago, um, Bill Holman uh, contacted Terry and said, how would you like to have the Mitchell Hedges skull at your event? And um, he brought that out and I thought, wow. And he said, you can, you can, you know, put your hands up close to it and feel it, sit down. And when I did, that skull came to me and went into my heart like a long lost friend times a thousand. In other words, it was natural, but unnatural. And I started crying uncontrolled and it was this feeling of love. And I thought, well, maybe that skull remembered me from when I was a little kid. Who knows? But, um, and, you know, I, I left it at that. And then this past spring, it came back to the conference again. 
And when I walked in that room, I'd been outside vending. And I walked in that room and I could feel that. Man, as soon as I walked close to that, it was like, wow. And then I had to tell that story, of course. But that skull has a lot of energy to it. And I've never felt an energy like that from a rock in all my life. That was just, uh, it was an amazing piece. And whoever made it, they were brilliant. You know, it was, wasn't was done with the laser. It wasn't done with any machinery. Uh, whoever created that, was it was in their mind and it was created. So, yeah. Anybody else? Hmm. Oh, good. Well, there there is a crop circle across from Serpent Mound. Actually, it's right near the spring where that water came from. And that crop circle occurred in 2003, August the 14th, I believe. And uh, the night that the crop circle was made, there was a violent thunderstorm. And we were on a ridge about eight miles away doing a drumming, a community drumming, a couple of hundred people. And everybody was taking pictures. And the funny part about it was this lightning storm came in about midnight and everybody left because we didn't want to get hit by lightning. This was the most violent storm I've ever seen with lightning. So we all left and the next morning, I think it was Delcy Wilson or somebody called up and said, go down to Serpent Mound, right down below Serpent Mound in the field and it's a soybean field that was knee high there was a crop circle, 276 feet across. And the eye of the crop circle was pointing right across the head of the serpent. And the interesting part is there's a fault line that runs right through there, across the crater, goes across the uplift, all the way over to Route 41 that meets another fault that comes down Route 41 right past her house. And the funny part about that was that that night, everyone was taking pictures. And when people started getting pictures back and looking at them, there was thousands of orbs in these pictures and they had geometrical patterns in them. And the man that runs that drumming site kept an album just for that reason. So whatever made that crop circle, it was done in a thunderstorm and there was some kind of energy that started around midnight and for whatever reason, it was formed in that field. And they did studies on it. And they found out that Bob and Ted weren't out there stringing a board. It was made by something that we have no idea about. But there has been people talk about seeing the orbs around the field, the blue orbs. And uh, the lady that owns the property, Molly Williams, across the street where the spring is, her mom actually passed away in that house the night of the crop circle. So there was some there was some connection with Molly and the grandmother and the mother and whatever was going on. And that's the same field that we photographed the the UFOs, if you will, that came in. So there's something magical about that area. And I think a lot of it has to do with the magnetic anomalies that have opened up a gate there, if you will, and allows things to happen. Even our dollar store is haunted, which is really funny. They, we had a haunted house across the street. They tore it down. It was a little cow pasture. And lo and behold, here comes this dollar store. Well, the first thing you know, they opened it up. And the manager used to be a customer in the shop. And she came over and she said, you know what? She said, we opened up today. And there's a big bottle of laundry detergent was on the top shelf. And it fell off all by itself and exploded on the floor. And here's the video of it. So we posted that online. But ever since then, there has been nothing but problems over there. And whoever is doing it, same people that haunt us, I'm sure, they're just comical. They want attention. They do little games. They make things disappear and they bring them back. I mean, it doesn't happen time. I could go on and on about the things that have happened there. But it's just it just kind of reminds you that, yes, there is another realm. There's a lot going on there, and would you please pay attention to us? And and that's what we do. We just we kind of humor them, and we say, okay, we know you're here. Acknowledge them. And everything's fine. The people that lived in the house before I bought it, the undertaker, 
when he pulled in that driveway and said, have you got, have you seen any spoofs yet? Well, he abandoned that house 25 years previously because they couldn't take the spirits. And they were run off by it. And they were very religious people. And so I think the religious aspect of it really has something to do with, they were afraid. There was a lot of fear there and they couldn't deal with what was going on there with the spirits. Where in the other sense, Terry and I, we were like, yeah, it's kind of funny, you know. So we've got, we have 14, <laughs> we have 14 cats, okay? And there, there's doppelgangers here, okay? I, I'm seeing more than once on the property when I'm in the shop or I'll be outside at the same time. It's happened to Terry, it's happened to numerous people. And they're in three dimensions, it's really cool. But um, the other night, I'm, this is only a couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting in the bedroom and I got one cat. Her name is Ruth, named her after my mom. And she always comes to the door and wiggles the handle to come in. I open the door and in comes Ruth. She didn't say anything. Went right into the bathroom, started eating, or so I thought. Went and sat back down in the bed and five minutes later, she, she, she hit the door. Oh, wait a minute. Open the door and here comes Ruth. Wait a minute. And this time she was talking to me. So even the cats are doppelgangers. So it's not only people, but you have to laugh at it. You got to like, okay, now they're really messing with me. So that, that's where we live. And it's just, it's just a reminder that we're not alone. Um, there's a lot of people around us, spirits all the time, just like Chief. Um, he's, he's there. He's guiding us. Um, I, I, you really can't call them spirit guides, but they're they're actually it, it's just nice to acknowledge that it's there and, and to have an open mind to accept it and say, okay, and and talk to them. You know, maybe they'll talk back and tell you something. Mm, no, I mean, no, other than my uncle was chief of police in Roswell. That's just that's just another problem. That's a, that's another circle. Okay, my uncle, Uncle Art, my my mom's oldest sister, Eva, was married to Art Brocious, and he grew up in Roswell, New Mexico. He was in charge of the Japanese internment camps in 1942. He became chief of police in Roswell in 1945. Okay, when Roswell went down, apparently he knew what was going on, but he never spoke of it. And I, maybe he was threatened. I don't, that, that's all I can assume. But his actions speak louder than words because I used to go out there and visit him every summer. Mom would fly me out there or drive me out there to Roswell to meet Uncle Art and the family. And he would take me all around New Mexico and show me all the cool stuff that had to do with air defense and missiles. Why did he do that? It took me to White Sands, El Gordo, um, and I learned all about the Goddard Space Center and how missiles were designed and all that. And I never really thought too much about it until I was drafted in 1972. I was the last draftee, by the way. So I went in, and lo and behold, I think old Uncle Art was pulling strings because I went into air defense. And I got to learn all about those things that went across the radar screen that you didn't see. You didn't see that. Okay. I didn't see it. But it it's funny because I learned that there are other things out there, UFOs, and you're told not to see it. But yet he never, of course, he passed away. And I never got to ask him about Roswell. But when we were going to Roswell, Back in the 60s, there was never any talk about UFOs. That's just a new thing that, you know, in the last 20 years that people started building it up and is it out there? So what's funny is the acknowledgement from the government is, oh, yeah, they're real. But have they apologized to anybody? There's a lot of people, they think you're crazy. And, you know, I know I'm not crazy. I've seen some pretty cool things. Yes, Terry. Terry? <laughs> You want to say anything? <laughs> I think I covered it.
Pretty much so. Yeah. But no, really, life is just about circles. And and uh, it's nice if you can witness those circles and put them together. It might take 20 or 30 years, but you get the answers eventually. Yes, sir. You mentioned falls. Yes. They're not circles. They tend to be very simple. Can you comment? Can you comment just as a geologist, like in your experience, almost in well, any observation? Yeah, oh, yeah. Um, the, the fault lines, and it's not just in Ohio where there's a fault line, there happens to be a certain amount. Um, the first example I've seen of, of um, how fault lines affect things is in Fort Worth, Dallas, I-35. And you can be driving down I-35. All right. Have you ever witnessed pouring rain on one side of I-35 and dry on the other? Well, because there's a fault line going right down the center. And so that affects weather. It has a lot to do with magnetic anomalies. And it'll actually, it does the same thing in Serpent Mountain with the crater. Storms will come across from the west predominantly. And it's like they get up right to the edge of it and then they stop and they go around it or they dissipate. And the first example I seen of that at Serpent Mound was on the Weather Channel. And I'm sitting there watching these color-coded green and then red. It's getting really violent, you know, and it gets right to where I am at the edge of the crater, and it turns brown. It's gone. I go like, well, what happened there? And I start talking to the farmers. The farmer said, you know what? Our crop yield inside the crater is less than outside of the crater. Of course, they didn't know there was a crater there at that time. It was called a crypto explosion structure. But it's just, for whatever reason, those magnetic anomalies actually affect weather. They, at a certain amount, I've seen it affect cars, computers, and batteries, where people will be driving rental cars from out of town. They park somewhere in the crater and the battery goes dead. They got to call up the tow company. And another guy at the tow company, AAA, right across the street. He said, there's nothing wrong with that battery, it's fine. I just had to charge it up. Alternator's fine. Why? Well, the energy got sucked out of that battery. And we've documented a lot of that as we go along. Um, and, and it just at the last conference we had, what was the fall equinox conference? I, I told people, I gave a little talk. I said, when you get out of your car, make sure you take your keys with you because sometimes your door locks will lock automatically. And I've had that, happen. I've seen that a lot. And I'll be darned, Baba Jabal <laughs> come over to my booth and he said, you, you said, take your keys with you. And I left them in my car and my car doors are locked. I gotta get my keys out. So it happens all the time. Oh, hey, when ancient aliens, we did some for ancient aliens and uh, it was funny because we went out into the crater and they put the fresh battery packs in there. Okay, start talking, you know, you're you're on. And they'd say, oh, wait a minute, our batteries went dead. It wasn't five seconds and their batteries were drained. And they changed three different sets of packs and they kept getting drained and drained and drained. And they ended up going back to my shop to do the interview. With Bill Holman, if he is available and ready, I know he's available, we'll see if he's ready. Bill is a current guardian of the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull. Anna is her name. Mitchell Hedges spent his last eight years of life being cared for by Anna. Spent her last eight years. She was the previous owner of the Mitchell Hedges Crystal Skull. So her last eight years, she was... Uh, Bill was basically her caretaker, and the he and the skull got to know each other very well during this time. Uh, she passed away at the age of 100 on April 11th, which was Bill's birthday. It's Bill's desire and hope to carry on the legacy of Anna and her father with the crystal skull. Bill has the same adventurous spirit as F.A. Mitchell Hedges, his great hero, and Indiana Joan himself. All right, please welcome Bill Holman. He's probably grabbing her now, so we'll give him just a moment.
Okay, this takes just a second to set up. So. One more time. Uh, it's really interesting working with the skull because uh, he communicates and uh, he's really excited to be here. And thank uh, you. What it is is it's the connection uh, and the remembrance, and it's it's what the skull is working on really right now. It's helping people to remember who and what they are and. Not as, oh, I'm Bill or Bob or Tom, but our soul, spiritual self, who we are from the creator and bringing that forward. It's helping us to realize and wake up with the help of all the different uh, en galactic entities and all that are working with us now to re come into our God power, that we are the uh, men and women of that are God, men, and women. And so it's really a joy to feel that energy and the true energy and our true power is this love from the creator. And the, what the neat thing about the skull and working with it, it's connected to that universal love. And so while it's here, I have a good feeling you're, it uh, fills the room with it and it helps us to remember that feeling way, way back inside of ourself and bring it forward. So uh, it's, you know, it's a joy to be able to do that. But I've found that as I go around, uh, each one of us is coming together. We're finding our spiritual family, our real uh, roots of who and what we are. And when we come together with these uh, who and what we are, and our, our true power, we become more powerful. And we become more able to say what's in our hearts. Because a lot of times we, we'd see different things, we'd feel different things, but we keep it to ourselves. But we're starting to be um, empowered to say, oh, this happened to me, or you, the light language is working through me. And it's, you know, it's really uh, true communication, like we were, we were saying earlier, is just mind to mind communication. And I, I feel that we're, becoming more of the God men and women that we really are. And that's going to make the difference on the future, the future of our, our world. Because as the creator beings, we make everything happen around us. We create everything. And you know in your life, you have a bad day and you're mad. Well, the next day you're probably, especially now when things are happening so fast, that it comes right back on you. So you have to be very careful how you think uh, with and control your thoughts and be able to uh, you know work uh, positively in your life and with your family and your friends to, because we are the creator beings. And uh, there's a negative force here, but the negative force is here because it's here to help us, to push us out of the sands and into the field to make a difference as creators. We sit there and watch everybody. He should have done that. He should have done that. Well, nothing gets done. But when we're pushed enough and squeezed enough, we're in the field now and we're making differences. And we have, we're finding our spiritual family. They're coming, we're becoming back together. And, you know, being with here, uh, 
it's a really a, a blessing and honor to uh, to spend this time this weekend with everyone here because you all are awake to what's happening and so many people if you go to different parts of the, uh, the country world or town or whatever they are still asleep so much but people are waking up and uh, and it's really neat to be in a room full of people that are aware and are experiencing things that years ago you wouldn't talk about what you saw or what you felt but now it's coming out and I find I found that when uh, I come out and say what's in my heart even though it it shocks people sometimes or whatever but it is a start the seeds that are planted to chart changing the world and making a big difference so that's what's that's really what's really neat and so uh, this one of the things that the skull is pushing it's saying it's time for joy it's for, time for peace it's time for love it's time for happiness it's time for us to focus on that and as we create we're going to create a world that is a world that we want for ourselves our family our friends in the world and can we do it we're doing it and it's happening and it's really exciting and we're getting help from the ben dimensional beings the other side are helping us a lot but uh, they will give us the all the information and it's up to us to make the difference here we can't they're not going to come down and save us they'll give us the information how we can save ourselves and that's where we're at right now it's time for us to you know uh stand up and make a difference in the world which we are doing and it's really awesome and you're not we're not alone it's not just oh our small group here but this it's awakening is happening all over the world and that's what i'm really seeing as i travel that you know different groups are starting to realize and you know uh you know working with uh the the tie to the earth the indigenous tie to the earth they're it's very important for you and all to bring out that uh connection between the land the sea the animals and and the, the people that was the way it was back in the past that knowledge is there and it's been beaten out of a lot of the, us but it's time to bring that back because that is the truth and in getting into your truth and being your truth there's nothing more powerful than that and we and finding that it's also your joy. So we're having fun with that. Uh, one of the most things I found in insane that's really important and powerful now, because everything we see in other people, oh, this person's this, and this one's this, there's a part of us is that's in everything because we're all connected to the, the universal mind. We're all in part, we are all one, but we're all individual. So we need to say when somebody bothers you or something really bothers you, you need to say that I forgive you and I send you this universal love. And just by saying that, if you just close your eyes for a second now and think of somebody that really has kind of made you mad and has hurt you in the past, just say, I forgive you and I send you love. And it's like a big weight off your back because if you have uh, resentment that way, it's tying them to you. It's not hurting them, but it's hurting you. And as we know that, it's time to now release all those ties and bring back your power and to become all that we can be. And that's what I've been learning and working with the skull. And uh, I th that's what's given me hope and joy in the future. So we're going to do a meditation in a while. And I do meditations and I do meditations that are uh, working on healing the planet, healing the people and uh, working and sending out that universe of love. So I hope you'll like it because that's what we're going to do today in the meditation. And so, but the difference is this, when you have a few people around the skull, the skull magnifies that energy. Okay. So instead of, 100 people or 50 people, it's like 500, 500 people, 550,000 people. We're, 
we're sending out the energy. The more you can focus your mind, the more you can set out these good energies, we can really make a difference in the world. So that's kind of what we're doing and what's what it's all about. So uh, since she said I have to talk right now, so I'm, I'm doing, yeah. Uh, people on Zoom, do they can they still connect? Say it again. The people who are on Zoom, they still connect to the physical. Oh, guess what? Tell them uh, there's a feeling that you should be feeling in your heart, and they should be feeling it. And we can wake them up a little more and see what you think. So it's, what it does is it brings that energy down. It brings it from the earth and the mother, and we bring it back. And just let that energy flow out to all of us. A lot of times you'll feel it in your heart or you feel it in your third eye, but it's it's fun and you got to have fun. So uh, any other questions before we start our meditation? So, yeah, there, there's some really beautiful souls here. And when I listen to some of the people talk and some of the questions and stuff, it's just kind of blows, blows me away. So, uh, I think this is going to be, it'll be a very powerful, beautiful weekend when we all get together. And, and also, you know, coming to our power and realizing, you know, we come from all different walks of life and everything, but the real essence is what's inside ourself, our soul. And we've, we're in a, what we're here learning is we're here learning lessons. And, you know, we can take it hard or we can just have fun with it. And, Let's have some fun. I'm ready for that. <laughs> so, no questions, huh? Okay, boy, I'm doing good. Huh? How old is the crystal skull? You know, what it is, uh, what makes, you know, there's all different people and they say all kinds of things and you have uh, academia that say that the pyramids are 2,000 years old and they say this is that. They don't want to really understand. They don't want us to have true history. And the skull is made against the grain, which is pretty much impossible. Because if you try, it's very, very hard, but it's very brittle. And if you tried to do that, it, it would shatter and wouldn't be here. It has lenses and prisms that are built inside the crystal as a 90 degree turn. And that's what helps with the meditation because it takes you real easy from the third plane up to the fifth plane. And you just do it naturally. It has, with the lenses and the prisms, to be able to do that on the Earth today, they have to go up to the space station, and they have experiments where they're growing crystal and growing them pretty much almost atom by atom until they can shape it exactly what, the way they want it. It has several uh, prisms. It has lenses. The eyes take you into a different world when you look inside. It has dolphins on the cheekbones. There's the head the tail and the fin, and there's, if you catch it light, you can see it, there's one on this side and one on this side. So it's like double dolphins, and the double dolphins are like Lemuria. So they, they, that's what they, that's kind of what the symbol of Lemuria was. And a lot of that is stuff is coming out today. If you look in the back of it, it's like a human brain. You can see two halves of a human brain. And if you look in the eyes, that's where it takes you into that world of crystal. Like Crystal Palace, so uh, it uh, you know who who made it or how it was made. You know I work with a lot of very special people from uh, all over the world, and what I'm being told and guided and connecting to my inner self, uh, the skull was created in a in a galaxy that is far away that we don't even, the planet's not even there anymore, and it was brought here many, many eons ago. And as you follow through people's past lives, people in different parts of the world, you know, if, they're, if it's in Egypt, it's Tibet and different things, the skull shows up in different parts of their, uh, their literature as being, being there. So it's been around a long time. And, you know, I am with it because I have connections with it from the past, you know, we're we're more than a physical body. We're a spirit. We're a spirit being, and my soul is connected 
definitely to the stall. At first, when I took over the job, I didn't realize why it was pulled and pushed that way. But as I've been working with it for the last, uh, you know, Anna passed in 2007. So since then, I've been on my own, not really on my own, because I used to come up and do these talks, and I could always feel her and her father behind me watching me. And if I did something wrong, I know they're going to whack me. So I try to do a really good job. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it uh, no. There's uh, if you really look, there's you know there's people try to say, oh, it's this or that. Show me one bit of proof that that anyone could prove where and how it was made and who, who did it. There's there's different ones that say it, but when you look at whether they're proof, they don't have any proof, you know. And so the skull is here, and the people that have spiritual connection, especially with the skull, are drawn to it. I don't want you know, we've learned it's not to be a sideshow and bring people to it. It's bringing certain people to it, and they're drawn to uh, connect with the energy and help them because it mirrors your inner self, and it brings out uh, your gifts and abilities that a lot of times have been forgotten by living in, in this life we live, and you're born, you know, your family is your best teacher. They give you all the mess ups in your life and now after you leave home now you have to straighten yourself out but uh the thing is it's it's the lessons that we learn and that's what it's all about skull works on light and sound and frequency and uh that is the key because they say the skull has this knowledge of the universe has been stored within it they their legend of there's 13 crystal skulls and the knowledge they say, you know, that you're talking about 2012 and how things have started to change since then. Well, and you know, when 2012 happened, the Mayan calendar came to an end. Everybody thought it was that, oh, the end of the world was coming and people were ready to sell their house and go live in the, in a, you know, just anything. But the next day, 2012, you got up and the sun was shining, a beautiful day. And you're still there, your body's still there, and you think, Ah, nothing happened. But what happened it was a, it was a frequency energy shift that happened on the planet. This helping to come into this higher frequency, bringing us into the fact that we're we are God, men and women, and and breaking the the negatives that we've had and we've been carrying all this time. And so it's one of the first steps. And then there were steps in nineteen uh, twenty nineteen. There was the energy that came through there, 21, 22, and now in 23, there was a great stream of energy that came in called uh, like a blue ray that uh, hit the earth in uh, November 4th. There's another one on the 18th and another one on the 25th. So there'd be three of them. And this, I, I'm not sure if this is the last time it's happening, but these are advancement of spiritual growth for humanity and the people that you know are still asleep they're getting pinged with this stuff and they're opening up and their vibrations are changing and a lot of you have been spiritually connected all your life but you are the light workers you're the ones that are here to open up and help humanity raise but there's a lot of people that have been asleep but this higher energy coming in now no, I, I've been goofy as heck since the fourth, <laughs> but I'm here. <laughs> but have you felt a difference in the last couple of days? The energy shift. I don't know anybody. It's it's been pretty intense. So, but uh, so there's so much things are happening. And it's like we're going into the ascension. But the ascension is really us taking back our power and becoming the creator beings we are. You, you can and do and be anything you want. The only thing is we have all these uh, programs that are running inside of our head telling you, oh, you can't do that, or you can't do this. So the skull helps because it gets rid of those programs and help people to become all they can be. And that's the, the real joy of my job. And with everyone, you know, you came here and you have special gifts. So maybe you can write, maybe you have the, the light language coming through you. That's those are God's gifts that you have. But a lot of you're not always aware of it. But 
when you come into that awareness, you find there's no greater joy than connecting to who and what you are and bringing that out and helping humanity with a song, with a, with a wisdom words or anything you have that's yours special because you do have, everyone has it. And when you connect it, everybody wants to know who and what we are, who, who am I, what's my purpose? You just being yourself is your purpose and bringing that out. And then you, it's like we have this picture we're making and oh, here's your full self. You put them in here, there's a piece there and a piece there, a piece there. And pretty soon it's a beautiful picture and we're all working together. And that's what it is. It's a matter of us coming together and really realize that we are a family, a family of God, creators working through us. And that's what's so powerful. You know, there's, they say there's 3,000 at least different uh, races in this galaxy alone. And, you know, and then on Earth, you know, what we, what we think, and this has been a, a program on us of trying to separate us, is saying that we're this and that. We're, we are human beings. We're under one race. We are all one. And by separating that and realizing, trying to make you think you're not, we are one race. We are the human beings. And it's time for us to realize we're all brothers and sisters under the higher power. And that's that's what that's the change. And if we can start opening that up, and you know, just it's we do it in our life, it affects somebody else in their life, and we're gonna like a throwing a, a, a rock in the pond. We're just gonna send out those vibrations, send out that good love, make a difference. I'm I don't know about you, but I'm ready. And I have fun doing it. <laughs> so, and so I say what I feel, and I found that to be the best thing. And even you know, if it seems, oh, it seems a little bit, oh, you know, if, you, if I talk to some people, probably if I went down to the Catholic Church and said some of this stuff, they'd probably be ready to lock, <laughs> lock you up, you know. But this is what's happening. It's, the church is here to control people. And we are not, we, our church is inside. And we're here to praise and pray together and by ourselves and share that love. So that's what this call is about. Uh, did I answer your question? Because I got carried away. Yeah. <laughs> that was just sitting there about a minute. And I keep feeling this here. I was just, I don't know. Yeah. And sometimes it goes down into me. It's just doing it right now. Right. I've never felt that. Well, you know awesome. what it does? It it, it uh, let's say there's a blockage or something. It it helps to relieve it, so it starts working. Whatever out. it's so doing, it's cool. Just let it do it. Yeah. <laughs> so it does it out of love. So yeah. and that's what's so good about it. And it's very subtle. And so yeah. Yeah, if you try to oh, you and you have to think about it this way. It's like energy flowing. And if you take that and you squeeze it, it cuts the energy down. So if you try to control the energy, it shuts down. If you let the energy, then it you don't know what it's going to do. It do some really major things. So that's what will happen. And we're going to do a meditation. We're going to send out the energy to the planet, to the world. Then we'll also take time to go into ourselves because it's time. You know, there's nothing as long as it's not affecting somebody else. You can create and be anything in your life. And so it's time to look at your life and say, "Hey, I want." this for my family. I want this for my friends. I want to have, you know, whatever it is, there's nothing that you can't have, but it's up to you to realize it and not let anything stop it. So we'll do that in the meditation too, which works out pretty neat because, hey, it's time to bring our power back and have fun doing it. So any other questions? I, is the camera following me okay? <laughs> okay. No. <laughs> so okay. Well let's let's do a meditation. And what I want you to do is just we're gonna start with the breathing. This breathing is really important because it helps connect you with your higher self. And what you want to do is you would concentrate on the on your crown chakra. And you're going to breathe in on the count of 10, 
filling your stomach with air. And each time you take a breath, one, two, your stomach's getting fuller and fuller. We do all the way out to a count of 10. And you can feel your diaphragm starting to move and be vibrated. Okay, and then as you breathe out through your mouth, you're going to let the air come out. And then, but you're thinking both times. As you breathe in, you're breathing in the breath from the creator. You're breathing right into your crown. And you're bringing that, all that love and energy through you from the creator. Then you hold it for 10 seconds. And then you bring it out, breathe out through your mouth. And as you breathe out through your mouth, it's still coming out your crown chakra. But you're breathing back all that into the, the creator. And he's taking that energy that you're bringing. It's being purified and cleaned and healed. And you then you feel the joy. So let's just see if you can, how it feels for you. We'll just do three breaths to start with. And my advice, if you choose to, is you should try to do this three or four times a day. It's very simple, but it is a very powerful connection. So as you're breathing in through your nose, fill your stomach with air. Maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hold your breath. And then you can feel it going right up to your heart. Hold it for ten, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then breathing out through your mouth, but feel the energy going out your crown and feel the creator accepting everything about you, loving everything about you, and just letting it go. Okay, we'll do two more breaths, breathing in. Now do it on your own. We start the meditation and connecting the skull with the other 12 skulls. I connect the skulls now. Ask, asking for guidance and help from all the divine beings that choose to be with us tonight and join us in this meditation. All the galactic warriors of light, the councils, all the divine beings that are with us, be with us now. And there's a circle of light around all of us, and we're in the circle together. Feel the light. Now, as you breathe in, just think about your crown chakra and just bring in this beautiful light from way high in the sky, way high. It's, as far as you can see, it's coming down, coming down. It's going right down and into your crown chakra, through your body, into the top of the skull, through the skull, down into the earth, deep into the earth. Feel it going down into the earth, down to the center of the earth, touching the heart of the mother. And you have that great love for the mother. She loves you and all, all of the, the creation so much. Just feel that love coming back up. It's like a, a sunset paint, this universal love. It's going into the skull. and The mother and father energy is coming together. Feel it expanding, expanding. As that expands, there's a beam of light to each one of us right in our heart chakra, sending that love and light into us. I'll take that energy and bring it into the earth, into the earth and into the crystalline grid of the earth. And it's important to send this love and light that we create together, send it around the earth, send it, send it now. And you can do it with your mind. You'll feel it going all over the earth. Send the love, send the light. Going from the North Pole to the South Pole to the East to the West, surrounding the whole earth with this beautiful diamond light, this beautiful sunset paint, light of the 
mother. And under each pyramid, and there's we, there's a lot of them we know, but there's thousands of pyramids we still haven't found and don't know about. The light goes underneath in those grid lines, and it goes directly underneath. And then there's a beam of light that comes from underneath and the grid lines up to the top, to the capstone. And you see all over the earth, our beautiful light that we've been working together, coming out, going high into the sky, high up into the clouds. And now it spreads out. And you have the power. You work together, spread that power around the earth. Send that beautiful light around the earth. And feel how much the creator loves you. Say it. I love you. It's loving you so much as you do this work. Thank you. The joy, the peace, the love. And now, is it? It's all around the earth. It's like rain of this, all this beautiful light coming down on the earth, touching the souls of every person, every person on all the earth, every part of it. And if you see places where there's disease or there's hurt or there's famine, there's war, and there's people that need the light, you are the light worker. Take it. If you feel someone in your family needs it, send it to them or send it to any place you feel needs this help now. Send it to Israel to save the light and make the peace. Send it. You have the power to do it now.
Now I'm going to pull us all back into that circle of light again. We back into the circle of light together. Now I want you to think about yourself and what you love and what you like and what's important. And start filling your life, and filling your world with things that you want to make you happy and enjoy. You can do or be anything. Just allow it to come through. And think what the things you want for yourself, your family, your friends, and your work. I'm, me, I'd like to see a place of peace on earth. I'd like to see where we have a place where we have good food, good healthy water for all. A place where it's people learning gifts that they have to bring them out the power of their minds, their hearts, and their soul, and that connection, and becoming their whole self. That's what I see. But put in your world what you want. Go do it now. Yeah, I'm going to bring us back on the count of five. Just feel the energy as it starts to flow back into your body, too. Feel it flowing out your fingertips and toes as you're coming up three. That's where you fill your heart with that love. It's a part of you. The vibration is with you. Send it out. Or you're almost back. Now, five has been counted. And back whenever you're ready. Open your eyes whenever you're ready. So God's love, connection between the other 12 stars. Open now, sending much light. Thanks for all of those that have helped us and join us. Yes. A lot of love. Feel that love? Wow. It's a good feeling. <laughs> Remember the song that the world needs now, right? Yeah. This is now. It's time. <laughs> so I'll show you something. If you want to try something real quick, close your eyes. Put in your third eye. Think about something that you love very much. Someone, something that you love very, very much. Now take that. It's your heart and your mind together with create. So you move that down into your heart. You fill it, let it fill your heart with that love. Filling your heart with all that love that you felt. And now with your mind and your hand, just send that love towards the skull, into the skull. Send it into the skull. 
send it right out. There, go right in there. And now, as soon as it goes out, it comes right back at you like a big wave, like a big wave of light, sparkling light that's going from your head all the way through your body. And every cell of your body, feel the light going through and dissolving any negative in any cell, any part, all through your body, from your head all the way down. Oh, and feel the joy. Hey, hey that works pretty good. <laughs> So anybody with the meditation that any, because uh, what it is, if you say something, there's somebody else is feeling the same thing and they'll say something and it builds and it helps each other. Because a lot of times you'll feel it and you don't want to say anything because it, uh, why? maybe I just felt that. But if you say it, there's usually somebody that you help by saying it. So was there anything that you, did anybody have anything that came through strong that they'd like to share? Yeah. What you said happened. Um, sorry, I'll speak up. When I sent it to the skull, I felt it come back immediately. Immediately, yes. Yeah, right in my head. It was like a surprise, like a mirror. And did it feel like just splash all over you, like, like, like a bubble of love? But yeah, you sent it, yeah. it came right back. Yeah. Sent it out here and it came right back here, and then it started to just go down over like a blanket. Yeah. Uh -huh. What he was saying is when it came out, it, this is underestimating, came back at least like a million fold. It, you know, what, what sent out, it was a wave that came back. Yeah, it, you send out this, but the stream comes back like a like a tidal wave. Yeah, and that's what I feel. Yeah. Yeah, please. Standing back here, towards the end, close my eyes longer. And there were concentric rings that went out from the skull and filled the whole space. Yeah, and it's it's what we're doing. We're creating it. We're doing it. So that's what's so cool. And and it's why you're doing it. You're having fun. And that's a really that's pretty neat. <laughs> so yeah. Any other questions or anybody else have anything they'd like to add? Could you, I think you're, you may, you may feel funny saying it, but it comes out and it helps somebody. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking that it comes back stronger because we're all putting into it right now. So like I put into it, but I don't just get back my love. I get back everything. Back everybody. Yeah. 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 Maybe not even just here now, but like for all the time that that object's existed. It's sent in the back. Yeah. Yes. For me, when they speak of light language, for me, rather than translating with my voice or anything like that, I see the energy. And what's so interesting is I see the energy of the skull in you right here in your skull. You have the same energy, it's like so connected. You're so connected with the skull. I see it in you. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've been, yeah, I've been doing it many, many lifetimes. So yeah, I have that connection and I'm here to share. That's what I'm here for. So thank you for seeing that. <laughs> and as you take this around the world and speak to people, rather than uh, going up into ships, I've had ships just come down around me. And I put me in a um, round flower of bed, kind of med bed type thing. Mm. And what they have shown me um, is that I can bend crystal and rocks. And um, I even see letters and symbols in them, and I can even. Hold the, hold the crystal in this hand, another one in this hand, and symbols will start engraving in another crystal. So I really, really, um, I, I don't know anywhere to find out information about it. And I'm just wondering if in your travels, you've heard anything about these things. Well, yeah, give me your name and number, but the thing is, what you are is you're connecting to those past lives where that's where you were working as a priestess. 
and he, uh, I would like to do, if I get Kath up here, uh, we, we've been working out a system of working with the skull. And I like to do that. They say I got time to do it. So I'll show you where we, we work together and I am able to remove blockages from people. And, and the blockages are so important because let's say you were a past life this happened or in this life where uh, something happened to you and somebody told you you couldn't do this, you couldn't see angels, you couldn't fly, you couldn't do this, and you and you believed it because they told you you couldn't. And they were they don't have any power to do it, but you since you did believe it, you put the block up. And what's so important is taking away those blocks, clearing it, and seeing how they're really ridiculous, these things that are controlling us when we look at them. So we clear them out, and then when we do that, uh, it's really neat because then the person becomes empowered, and they're bringing out all their special gifts, and it's really pretty exciting. So uh, if you like, we'll, we'll bring a person up here, and I think if you be, since you had the question, well, she just had the, the question about crystal, and if you'd be open to do it in front of people, because it's usually we like to do it personal, because sometimes it comes back personal. But uh, I think it it will be on what you're looking for. In um, my opinion, if you'd like to try it, well, I can try. Huh? Me? Would you like to sit up here and have? I can uh -huh. I know. Yeah, you consent. Well, then come on up. I can yeah, we'll we'll get. Yeah, yeah. Now, wait, now let's see. I want you to see if you feel. You have to. You yeah, have I will. To I'm gonna put. Yeah, I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna have you sit here. Let me see. I'll sit right here. And if you want to sit on this side, Pat, because you feel better in the back of the audience. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Said you want to find out about it, right? Your crystal stuff, the energy, and where it came from, and how you do it. Probably. Well, yes, and you're the you're, you're able to help through the topics. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. 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 Oh, before we start, did anybody else want to anything you want to say? That came through them. It's might be important for everybody. <laughs> so yeah, I want to bring this. Yes. No, I got work to do, and you just knocked me out. I knocked you out. I'm so tired. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. So. I just show you this. This it's been working pretty good. Well, that's unusual with science. So here's what we're been working on is prove up all the points. Well, we never know if this is really going to work. But yeah, it, it, every time it's it different. Every time doing it, it's like, I don't do it. Skull. <laughs> It's the one that does. So I can't, I could, like somebody said, oh, can you heal somebody? Well, you know, if it's supposed to, if it, it does work on your mental, your physical, your spiritual, and your psychic body. Usually when you have a problem in the physical, it's usually from a different part, different body that's causing the problem. Oh, I feel the joy, don't you? A lot of joy there. Yeah. But put your hands like this. There's energy coming from different places than this one right here. <laughs> so that love, God loves you most of the time. Thank you. 
Put your hands up real wide from the side. A little further. Now there's rings of energy with the skull, and it's that's why you're sitting probably in a ring of energy. A little bit further back because I want you outside the energy. Now watch how slow I go, go real slow towards the skull, and tell me if when you feel a shift in energy, if you do, just come towards the skull. Changes. You went through it, didn't you? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, keep coming. Let me try to hit another one. Keep coming. Keep coming. Okay, I'm going to bring you right here. You move up a little bit. Just relax. Relax. Just relax. What I like to do, and it seems to work quite well. Is I just work on these little connections and I see that between it's like it's not your throat chakra, it's your tongue. And there's energy between your third eye and your tongue, and there's a, a little blockage in that. So it's getting the connection from the connection to your higher self and then being able to connect to your channel. So I'm gonna think that out that will. if I do something and release it. Yes. It's okay. Yes. Okay, then I'm going to do it right now. Just relax. Take it right out. Right? The tongue. Something in the tongue. Mm -hmm. and then, just let it go. Let it go. You want to run again? Let it go. Let it go. Tell me you're letting it go. Let it go. Let it go. Oh, there you go. Oh, that was good. Absolutely. Oh, good. Now, carrying a weight on your back that's right between your shoulder blades. And I'm just going to reach around and help you with that. So I'll take it. Take it. So we're just going to do a little bit of work on you. But I just want to see if there's a connection that helped you to understand. Oh, feel that? Wow. Felt that. <laughs> okay, Kath, is there something that you want to? She's. Um... <clears throat> All right, now, what the skull does is he gives me one, two, maybe three of your past lifetimes. Not all of them, just a few that um, will help you in this lifetime so you can understand what you're supposed to be doing in this lifetime to bring it all together. And the reason you're feeling so much is because you have worked with the skull before in previous lifetime. And it's in Polynesia. It started, um, it was Lemuria, that's for sure, but it was in Polynesia, and I think Easter Island, we actually worked with in Easter Island, but you were very, very powerful, and whoever was the high priest there, he was very jealous and he would cut out your tongue. Uh, and I, I, this is absolutely incredible that you are saying this, because I have felt that. Really? Yes, but what I saw was that he, what he did was wrap two black snakes around me to try and stop, stop my voice. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, they cut off your tongue. It's time. It's time. It's time but now it's yeah. something from the past. Yeah. Now that's that was on. That's, that's what went away. That's, that's what away. That's on like Easter Island. So that's not in your life now. That's past. So, so that's so that's what, so that's that's what, what you do. You just getting rid you of wanted that. to let go of it. You told me you wanted to get rid of it. I did. Absolutely. So go to her throat chakra. Okay. Pull a snake out. Okay. It's, you don't want it. You don't want it, do you? Energetically. Okay. So here, I'm just take it and. Now it's going to unwind. Is he around this light? Oh, let's get this. And it goes in the light. Send it the light. There we go. Oh, there. Good. And then there's just a little bit more. It's right there on the side. Throat on the left side. And since we're doing it, let's get it all. Right side, too. Let's get it. Yeah. He was the first one he drew here. Yeah. Well, on this See, the skull draw, draws people. You were the first one he wanted to we're see. Not, we're not here to do a sideshow, 
but we're here because certain people are meeting with us. That and he wants to see. He wants to see. It's my, my, I, I got the job. I, I take it around. Yeah, well, honor for you, and because of your gifts that you have, and you are connecting more powerfully with them, and you're going to wow. see it differently, where you can use your gifts to help with mankind right now. And that's sure fun, isn't it? There's nothing better than that. Yeah. There is. Is there something else you want to tell her? Does a lifetime as a mermaid. And we lived in an underwater city. Love connecting crystals in the water. There you go. That's what it was. It was a crystal city under the water. It was beautiful. Um, silken gown that you had on a whole lot of gold on. And that was underwater, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. It's very watery. Okay, but do you have one more or anything else? Knock this out. Okay, take it like this. Pull it towards your heart. Pull the energy towards your heart. You create this energy. Come back around again. Pull again. Bring it around. Feel the love. Feel the love. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Feel the love. 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 Okay. Share that. You have gifts you can really have. What's next, right? I always say, you haven't seen nothing yet. So. <laughs> Okay. Well, that's it. Uh, not right now. Yeah. That was just, just we're working with it. It works out really good. It's really a neat how it helps people. So that's so what you do is you find your gift and bring it out. And I've been, you know, hey, if I find something better, I'll be doing it tomorrow. But until then. I'm sharing the love this way. So, yeah. Any anything that you experienced that you'd like to uh, share? Yeah. Um, here's a question from someone who Zoom. Okay. And they said, "What is the significance or symbolism of the crystal skull?" Okay. Well, you know, they, if, they if you were everywhere. if you were a civilization, advanced civilization, and you wanted to leave a knowledge to the future generations, you would put it in something that would be feared or loved very much. So it would be taken care of. If you put it in a, a bunch of paper, it'd probably get all messed up. If you put it, you know, so much stuff has been lost. But with the crystal skull, you see it, it has a lot of beauty to it. And it, it's protected. So this the knowledge is passed on and it's, it comes out with light, sound, and frequency. And so as we are coming forward in our evolution of knowledge in the world. We are going so fast. They're gonna be coming to a point where they're starting to see how uh, you can take knowledge and put it on crystal in light beams. And it stores it inside the crystal and they're able to pull it out. The crystal is piezoelectric quartz. It's the same kind of quartz that uh, computer chips are made out of. So it's like a major chip. And it also, when, you, when we did testing on it with a spectrometer, uh, they found out, and they didn't want to talk about it, but it has uh, element 77, iridium, uh, inside the crystal. And so it's, iridium is, uh, they, it comes from meteorites from outer space. So you probably have some iridium down your way. Thomas, no, oh yeah. So, uh, but it's so that, I think that should answer it more. And I have a personal question. Okay. So during the clearing, I felt the serpent being moved from her. Mm -hmm. So 
because I also felt it. Does that mean that no a collective no or if a collective one like it, yeah if you had something yeah you experienced this you light. could have been yeah and I what I did with it you saw that I took it and I yeah. threw it in the light and light dissolved it and if you really looked at it when it's going in the light you'll see all kind of faces and bodies and different things from the energy that was stored on that snake you know because when they created it so whoever did it when you put them in the light. It, it uh, it's like putting them a mirror in front of them, you know. Shows who did it, who did it. <laughs> so yeah, so you that's a possibility. I you know I we'd have to talk a little more about it to really know for sure. But yeah. I thought her voice sounded different after after, after you removed. It. Yeah, I think she'll in her dreams and stuff things will start really. Yes, because she has that, she's some, well, we, you, all of you here have, you know, you have these gifts that you have, and it, it's really neat, and uh, they're coming together, and we're starting to know our gifts, and connecting with the, the entities on the other side, are really our family, and they're working with us, and we were doing that meditation, did you feel all the, their love coming through, and appreciation for what we were doing, and you all were sending out a lot of love to the world and that was really i thank you all and thank you everyone yeah for sure thank you thank you thank you oh much love thank you. Yeah. <laughs> any questions i'll be here tomorrow talking too all right oh yeah right. we're just getting started yeah, I like to talk, so yeah, just <laughs> look out. Is it possible to get a picture? With is it yeah. tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah. 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 Here, hours and hours. Okay. Yeah, like Are these your glasses? Can't tell you. They've been around. <laughs> <laughs>